Sorry about that. Uh, this is a continuation of the previous stream. I forgot there was some house business that had to be attended to, and I forgot to put it on my calendar. Uh, so anyway, so back to faith-based computing part two. Uh, a few minutes ago, about half an hour ago, if you haven't, if you're just catching this one, check the first video. It's, it's a short one about um, essentially the idea of faith-based communities as nodes in the ant computer. Um, and so I was, I think at the time I, I wrapped up the last one, I was talking about sort of being authentic in your faith. And again, my position is that I believe in a benevolent creator and I don't want a one world religion, even if it's your favorite religion. I respect all faiths. I, I think that that spirituality is very, very important. And, uh, you know, I, I respect all, but the goal is, you know, in my heart, I don't, I, I think people of faith would not aim to hurt other people. So that's sort of at the baseline is like, do unto yourself, don't hurt other people. And um, for me, I celebrate the uh, face of, of the world. Um, so, because I think that's what makes the world beautiful. Um, and I was taught, I'm not sure I was talking a little bit about the, the, uh, different faith-based communities. So uh, the, the lens I'm kind of looking at is the um, megachurch movement in the U.S., uh, the Christian megachurch movement, but it's not exclusive to that. It's also, this would be applicable because the Noosphere Project is a global project um, across, you know, the Tikkun Olam in the Jewish faith, uh, Sharia law, um, Islam, uh, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, transcendental meditation, all of that is going to be linked into spirituality in working with our biological interface into the field and having that networked for social computation, in my opinion. And so what I'm saying is be authentic in your faith practice, be somewhat questioning about institutions, not that people running faith-based institutions are bad or operating from a bad place, but oftentimes the institutional structure is what's going to build the spiritual and computer. Um, and I've, you know, I had some people yesterday just sort of say, oh, I just don't have time to understand these new ideas. Um, it's too difficult. And I would say, no, actually you can do it, right? Um, I'm not anybody special. I'm just a mom. Um, you don't need an advanced degree. Oftentimes having advanced degrees and things means that you're educated into obscure things that aren't really, in my opinion, Again, this is all my opinion, the actual game itself. So sometimes actually not being educated and thinking the right way is helpful. It gives you a more open mind and go and pursue this, like understand game theory and complexity theory and agent based modeling, and then understand how that might apply to faith based communities as nodes in the computational superorganism. Because like, I think you can do it. I really believe in you. Like I have high expectations, but I if I can do it, you can do it, too. Um, so yeah, so B, hold your faith-based institutions accountable. I was talking about the, um, the children, right? How many communities of faith have schools and preschools and nurseries, right? Children are the channels to the field, like in the, the Christian faith, right? Like it is the little children, right? And because they're close, they're close to, to the divine, the children and the, and the aged, and the Templeton Foundation, the John Templeton Foundation, knew this very well. Now, he was a Presbyterian. Now, it's interesting because the Presbyterian, um, their main uh, educational institution, I can't remember the name of it, but it's in Princeton, which is also the center of the physics, right? The Institute for Advanced Study and Princeton Physics. So th there are some really interesting things about the Presbyterian faith. But in Templeton, like he had this article talking about money will teach you how to pray. And so in my mind, if you think about faith-based communities and again, in agent-based simulation modeling, so in the Adrian Tchaikovsky book, the, the children of time story, when the spiders, uh, they conquer, they're the spiders that are super smart with nanotechnology and they go out and they conquer the ants to turn them into literally an ant computer, right? So Tchaikovsky already has this in mind. Like Tchaikovsky knows what's going on with Conway's Game of Life and von Neumann Cellular Automata and genetic algorithms. And that these different nodes of their literal ant computer would function independently and they would know what part of the computer to tap because they were well organized. And so in my opinion, the, these faith-based computing systems will be about organizing uh, spirituality to make it computational because that is the power, the power of faith and the power of the heart. Um, so 
when I was at the Mormon Transhumanist Conference in the spring of 2022, um, the agenda of, of that conference, it was a day long event and pretty much every single, with the exception of maybe the politicians who were there shilling, you know, whatever their political agenda, um, even though they were mostly about free markets and deregulation, which is going to be great for the ant computer. Um, one of the presentations was faith as an app, right? Your religion as an app. Now, my feeling is the system in terms of accessing the field, it has a mystical quality. So whether you're, it's early Christian mystics or Sufi or the whirling dervishes or people doing, you know, ayahuasca, Santo Daime, all these things. Pentecostalism is a big one. I'm going to talk about Pentecostalism. Accessing the field through a mystical connection, right? Your soul and your spirit. And it's an individualized experience. And that's something that like the early um, uh, Protestants who were breaking away from the, the Vatican as an institution, right? That talk about a super organism. That's a super duper organism, right? It was about your communion with the divine, with with God was sacred. And, and I'm saying that that's sacred, in my opinion, also encapsulates an information field to which access is desired um, by some system for some purpose that I as yet do not fully, I don't comprehend. And I'm not making guesses about what that point is. But that mystical individual access. So while I'm saying be careful about holding your institutions of faith accountable, especially around impact investing, especially around education choice and technology-based systems and social wear systems around the homeless, right? I mean, there's a reason that these Christian megachurches are developing venture capital arms, and that comes directly out of Bob Buford's sort of leadership network of creating entrepreneurial churches that are going to meld technology and faith and put faith on blockchain to make it computational, all right? So hold those institutions accountable. But then the counter, because it's always the Hegelian dialectic, the counter to that is um, an individual experience, right? And so, you know, they always control both sides of the conversation. And then they're steering you from one side to the other. So the other side would be an app, right? Have your religious experience with an app. Have your um, transcendental meditation with an EEG headset. Have your heart entrainment with the heart math, right? It will get you into that space, that meditative space, that trance-like state. And then that through those systems, through those apps, through those, at this point, they're still device-based things, whether it's your phone with the infrared silicon hospital or your EEG gamified headset thing going on. Eventually, really, it's just going to be the organic nanomolecules, self-assembling nanomolecules and the frequency-based stuff, right? But so there's, you have to, you have to see both sides, right? So on the one side, you have to be um, thoughtful about the positions of institutions in terms of managing mission work and managing the poor, managing children, managing faith. But then you also have to be mindful about individual experiences and the fact that they're going to try to drive that into some sort of frequency entrainment based system so that they can network your individual experience with the divine, because that's what how this quantum biohybrid computing system is going to work, in my opinion. So and I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if there's a sweet spot, right? But if you're if you're curious, if you're a curious mind and this lens makes sense to you, and it may not, and that's okay because I'm, there's a lot of other hypotheses out there, but th consider that when we're evaluating. So, um, so I would say, so faith is powerful, the moral economy, right? They're going to be moving into the moral economy on both sides. So, someone was a little confused about the whole freedom movement and how that fit into simulation modeling. And I said, it's really important that you understand John von Neumann's cellular automata and Conway's game of life. And if you don't understand those yet, go online, Google a few videos. Like I know you can do it because you did it for all sorts of other like health stuff. <laughs> like, and, and I think part of the reason that people think that the health stuff is easier is because there's a built-in community around the health stuff that you can talk to and you can feel affirmed by knowing it. And then you can get a nugget and you can share it around the water cooler and feel like you're uh, self-reinforced. And that doesn't really exist with token engineering and some of the other stuff. But if you want to, if you're curious and you really want to know, that's, that's where you have to start. You have to start understanding us as agents, not in a simulation, meaning like they're going to make you a puppet, but simply like 
we are nodes of information interfacing with the field and then coordinating those nodes as agents um, on a protocol layer that has degrees of freedom is what creates the emergent behavior. That's the complex system to create emergent behavior. And the emergence is the computation, right? So there's a choice architecture. It's not unlimited choice. It's not that they're taking away all your choice because the computation wouldn't happen that way. It's that there's a protocol with boundaries in place, and then it's to see what happens. And that, that what happens in complexity is also going to be central to faith and spirituality, because that is the powerful connection to the field through your soul, in my opinion. Okay, so the moral economy is going to come. So again, problem, reaction, solution. We create problematic economies, right? And then the answer is going to be the free market. Now, the free market is never going to be free because it's going to be on the protocol layer. But the free market is based in biophysics, like how the body works. They, they, a lot of these folks imagine the body as an economic transactional system. Uh, cells are functioning to maintain homeostasis. Then that gets applied to economics at an economics level. All right. Similar thing. Now, we know it's not really about homeostasis because they're making up their own money and they're making up their own rules. And there's the, all the people who want to talk about the Fed and gold and blah, 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 blah. But ultimately, the token economy is based on biophysics. And they're looking to scale that up because it's all nested and fractal. So they're looking to use energy fields at scale. And that's the social currency. And they're going to want to instill the community currencies into the faith-based systems. And this goes back to like the 1890s, like the one world, unified world councils and things, council of world religions. And this, you know, again, the UN has its fingers in that, but it's not just the UN, right? The, the goal is to get spirituality. And, and it's also the ecumenical movement. So while on the one hand, I'm like, I don't want a one world religion. And I don't think that there's only one way to do it. In, in, in my view, and, and you're entitled to think there's only one way to do it. Please just don't try to proselytize on my page because that's not what we're about over here. Um, and my opinion is if you're the path that you're on is the right path, people around you will see that and they will be attracted to that path. So you don't actually have to do like all the other stuff. People will just be attracted to live like you because you're living in a good way, whatever, you know, and, and that's how it will work out. But the ecumenicalism is also a piece of this, the one world religion within, with diversity. And so that's where de Hoc fits in, right? So de Hoc was working with the UN on unified world religions. And de Hoc was the founder of Visa. And again, that's the token economy and that's the credit economy. And uh, de Hoc was born in the Salt Lake City area in Ogden. So I'm not 100% sure if he was... LDS, there's nothing really obvious that says that he was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but he was definitely grew up in that milieu because Ogden is that, right? And so he goes on to Visa, and then in his retirement, he's working on complex systems that he calls the chaotic age, um, you know, chaos and order and managing that. That's the complexity theory with complex systems. And Ian Grigg and his crew that were interested in those pressed flower currencies, right, that's going to evolve into Cello and Eisenstein and Cambar's beautiful money, they're imagining that, I believe, within an ecumenical religious context. And Again, Irvin Laszlo, the systems theorist, was very close with the Baha'i faith. Now, I'm not saying it's exclusive Baha'i. I mean, there are many faiths that have their own role in all of this. Clearly, the Vatican has a role and, you know, Jewish faith has a role and, you know, the, the, the Latter-day Saints have a role and the megachurches have a role. And there's many, many roles. Sharia law has a role. There's all of these different roles in play. But for an example, Laszlo, who, who is sort of lauded by many of these people in systems theory, and again, I would say the systems theory is linked to the human potential movement, as is linked to the spiritual access to the informational field, that that is the ultimate, ultimate goal, not just to control people as puppets, but to get in there and do something in the behind in that sacred space where maybe we're really not supposed to be while we're in these bodies, but to get in, to use our bodies to get into that space, that Laszlo spoke to the Baha'i and he's like, you guys are going to be the coordinators because you are both spiritual and science-based. And so in the Baha'i are very welcoming of all of the face. So like in Bill Gates, when I was first doing the education work, 
we have these ecumenical movements that were tied into social justice issues. Again, the moral economy. Um, now, they were very selective in how they framed their advocacy around certain issues like school choice and living wages and different things. But Gates was pouring money into ecumenicalism. And so again, like how do we hold it so that we can both respect people of faith across difference, but then also realize that the institutionalization of global ecumenicalism is part of the one world organizing force and this noosphere program. And I'm, I'm not sure how to hold that. I'm not sure what the right answer is, but I can see all of these pieces in play. And I know that faith is sort of the lever upon which the soul rests. And the soul, in my opinion, is sort of the crucible for this um, uh, archetypal morphogenetic system, which has a sacred quality, again, in my opinion, but it is the key to the energy is the soul. And then your faith practice is attached to your soul. And the organizing of that is part of the social computation. Um, so in all of this, um, and I, you know, we didn't get around to talking about this on our Arkansas trip, but one of the stops we made on the way to Arkansas um, was in Tulsa. And we, we have a, uh, Jason and I have a friend in Tulsa, my friend Hega, and I stayed with Hega overnight. We only had like one day in Tulsa, a good day. But when I had gone before in January of 2020, I didn't get a chance to go to Oral Roberts University. And I, when I had done my early education research, Oral Roberts, um, was I had seen was a leader in emerging technology ed tech. And I thought that was really interesting because again, Oral Roberts was evangelical and you know he had ties to Pentecostalism. And part of Pentecostalism is um, like speaking in tongues, right? Having this direct experience with God. And through that, it's um, it, it's like coming through. Right. And, and I, I don't want to misrepresent Pentecostalism, but this idea of the speaking in tongues is sort of a central part of that practice. And then the, the biology of being connected into faith is something that's not exclusive to Pentecostalism. Right. We have the Quakers and we have the Shakers and we have people for whom contact with the divine comes through biology in ways that are frequency. Right. And vibrationally based. Right. And in, you know, someone was asking about, um, so why are they poisoning people or why are they doing things that might impact children? And why are we seeing such a rise in uh, neurodiversity or spectrum disorder? And I would say, if you're trying on this lens that what they're after is using biology as an interdimensional computation device, the information in that field that in my opinion, there's some system that wants to bring forward out of the field. Our current social structures, our current linguistic structures, both verbal and written, are insufficient to bring forward the complexity of that information into this dimension. And so that's where synesthesia fits in. That's where art and music and iconography and steganography fit in. So it's something that is representative of a much deeper, more complex layered bits of information, like the, the pictographic information, the character universalis that Leibniz was after was something much bigger than than can come out of my mouth. Like, I wish I could like dance it. You know, that's in the Tchaikovsky books too, with the octopus. The octopus are like, oh, you poor people, like you're stuck with your blah, 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 blah language, but you can't change your skin color. You can't use light. You can't you can't use motion to do that. But I would say actually in religious practice, that is exactly what it is. So in terms of terraforming or creating, remaking a biology or a consciousness that's suited to this interdimensional work, I think that those children that in our current social understanding are maybe deemed outside the norm, right, are actually part of the interface right? Part of this aspirational interface of bringing the information through. And, and then there, there, again, there's a range within the spectrum of, 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 you know, within that, but many of the most gifted artists and musicians and composers are on that spectrum and they have access to things that those of us who are more in the bell curve just don't. And so I think that this is all, that this is on purpose. Um, 
So getting back to Pentecostalism, to me, that is the field. And when I started to research, like, why is Oral Roberts University in Tulsa a center for remote education on those robot sticks, right? Like with the iPads that would be mounted on a stick with a little roller platform. Now, again, they're global. And at the time, I did not realize how um, uh, expansive Pentecostalism was. I, I think it's it ranks really high globally as like one of the fastest growing denominations around the world, uh, Pentecostalism. And I was not aware of that because like for me, I don't know, I just am familiar with the basics, you know, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholic, what have you. I didn't, or, you know, general megachurch, I didn't realize Pentecostalism had that much force behind it, but it's a very, very growing religion and it's global. So within that context, remote education on these robot sticks made sense. Like the robots would like wheel around the campus. And it's it's fascinating because this campus was built, I think in the late 50s or 60s or 70s. It has that this very atomic city kind of vibe to it. Lots of brass and dark glass and reflectives. And then they have sort of this tower of prayer with a flame coming out of the top of it. And so, yeah, if you're working on the interdimensional field, you would go to Oral Roberts. That, that would make sense not just for educational technology and virtual reality immersion, which is a center of that, but actually also in blockchain. Because I knew early on that the goal was to blockchain religion. And I didn't really know why, but I knew it through the health system because many of the health systems, again, have religious affiliations. Many of the hospital systems are Catholic. Um, and I was seeing like these blockchain babies. And again, think, the connection not only of children into the field, but of the fetus, right? Of the morphogenetic field of embryology and, and the shaping of a baby in the womb that is very close to the divine, right? And so all this telemedicine, telehealth, especially in the global South, like this is coming through medical systems and a lot of these medical systems have religious affiliations. So I'm like, they want to blockchain religion. Like they want to blockchain your health records, but they also ultimately want to blockchain religion. And I'm trying to remember like Rick Santorum, he had some, like he was a Pennsylvania conservative senator who was Catholic and he was promoting Cathio, which was like a Catholic token, crypto token, right? And so he's on the leading edge, but a lot of like, I'm like, they're going to try to blockchain religion, whether that, and not just Christianity, all the religions, because again, that goes back to community currency, right? And who's pushing all of that? Well, that would be the Catherine Austin Fitz sector, right? Like, and, and the Charles Eisenstein, and let's have beautiful money to back the things we love. And let's turn the red button green. And let's do all of that stuff. That's the Bernard Leotaire. And where did community currency ideas start? They came out of IONS, the Institute of Noetic Science, which they're working on the field and subtle energy. So yeah, they're playing with the field. Faith is the field and they're playing. They The goal is to play with it with tokens and organize it and bring it to scale. And then to tell people stories so that they will stay playing with the tokens and just put that lens on and look at all with what happened in the resistance community and look at it like that. And I'm not necessarily saying that those are bad people, but just look, is that the game you want to play? Is that the game you want to play? Do you know where that game takes you? And I would say none of us know that at this point. None of us know that. So um, if you look up Oral Roberts, they are a lead not only in blockchain education and immersive reality, virtual reality education um, and the, the robot stick stuff um, in the global platform, but they also introduced in their dorm things called magic mirrors. OK, so the dorm rooms have mirrors that are telescreens. Yeah, just like 1984. And they they monitor your mental health. And then if you're feeling sad, then they're going to feed you Bible verses to like manage your mental health. And it's literally like you're having a life coach like these AI life coaches, but it's in a mirror. And so when I'm talking and, and again, the Pentecostalism is a huge global movement. Right. And so when I'm talking about tokenizing religion developing quote unquote moral economies, developing digital super organisms at a global scale. Um, you know, there's a lot of irons in the fire, right? Like you've got the Baha'is, you've got the Vatican, you've you've got, you know, the Jewish faith, you know, Shabbat, you've got all these things going, the LDS church, you've got, you know, a lot of stuff going on. But 
Pentecostalism, you would think, okay, maybe that's something we need to pay attention to is how our biology is accessing the field and how this is interfacing with emerging tech and how it could be potentially gamified. And, and all of this is like built into the architecture. Those mirrors are artifacts. They're communal artifacts. Um, and the other thing is, so when I was doing my education work um, in the mid to late 90s, there was a big gathering, a youth gathering and a gathering of volunteers in Philadelphia on uh, Independence Mall, right? So you talk about an archetypal field for the United States, Independence Mall, the Liberty Bell, the Constitution, those are deeply embedded concepts, I icons. You know, there's a lot going there, right? Well, where did Mr. Bobby announce his candidacy, his independence, right? At the Constitution Center. I'm just driving by yesterday and I'm dry it's been a bit since I've driven by the Constitution Center. And I remembered right behind it is the Samunaguchi uh statue of the big lightning bolt and the key for Ben Franklin, which I'm saying is the metaverse. It's on a wireframe pyramid. And um, that Noguchi statue dates back to the 40s, but it was only built in the 80s. But it is lightning between the kite and the key. And the key is cryptography and your digital identity, right? So literally, the next half block over is the Constitution Center, where Mr. Freedom Wallet is announcing his independence run in this highly, highly symbolic, energetically charged field. And then, you know, who knows if this is going to be working, but there's all sorts of scuttlebutt about, like, the Shanahan lady. Well, who's like Sergey Brin's ex-wife, talk about emerging tech, but is now romantically involved through some druidic hand tying ceremony and water blessing with the co-founder of Lightning Labs. Like we got a big lightning bolt, right? You know, it's probably you line it up and it'd be like behind Bobby's head, you know, symbolically, it's very important. So this field, this energetic field. So, okay, so the youth summit. So it was on Independence Mall, all the living presidents came, except for Nancy Reagan came instead of Ronald Reagan. All like bipartisan, right? Because we know that this is all bipartisan, right? Now we're moving into transpartisan. That's what Bobby's going to bring out, the transpartisanship. And it was about youth, it was about volunteerism, and it was a youth summit. And the guy who organized it came out of Oral Roberts. And it was connected through the Thousand Points of Light. Now, we know that Thousand Points of Light is bipartisan, like Bush, Obama, they're all about the thousand points of light. And what is the next system of computing? It is biohybrid computing, it is optics and it is photonics. And it's using light based engineered proteins, the rhodopsins and the opsins in our biology to do the coordination, right? And so it matters that that youth summit in the 90s at this highly charged place that's now reverberating forward with the Bobby Kennedy announcement was organized by thousand points of light that it was bipartisan and that it has these connections back to Oral Roberts because he was an Oral Roberts alum and to Pentecostalism. Um, and again, so I'm not saying any of these groups are bad or that I'm passing judgment. What I'm saying is the system itself understands that spirituality and faith is a powerful force. Faith-based institutions give people a sense of belonging and if we're talking about game boards and degrees of freedom and emergent behaviors, it is a very um, powerful social system. And, and knowing that, it is not surprising that Peter Drucker and Bob Buford got together and were planning the Christian megachurch movement, which again overlaps with the stuff happening. I'm trying to crossroads, again, crossroads, and we're talking the eclipse coming up, church in Cincinnati and Procter and Gamble and entrainment and frequency and light. Um, and okay, so that, so that gets into the Pentecostalism stuff. Look up the magic mirrors at Oral Roberts University. Again, they're telling everybody that it's all for good, but I think it's for trying to get in the back end of places that we shouldn't be. Um, I did actually, I've had some conversations recently. Um, one of the things on my Dallas map is this utopian community um, that was the the big dome, the Buckminster Fuller Dome, um, was was there, like named. I'm trying to remember the name of the dome. Lynn, you have to help me out. Um, the, the 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 dome tower with the Buckminster Fuller Ball was named for this utopian community, a socialist utopian community in Dallas, which is kind of ironic, given now, like now they're going to sell the free market as it's the new planned economy. All right. Um, 
so there is this aspect of utopianism. And I've talked before about the real estate, about Adam Newman and the kibbutz model, right? And the kibbutz model is kind of like a faith-based community. It is a faith-based community, but it's a faith-based community in architecture. It's collective, it's a collective living community. So you can imagine that the mega church movements would start to have that too. And like, again, the LDS church is the largest landowner in Florida and they're developing smart development. So if we're thinking about the AND computer as mixed use developments where you have housing, where you have schools, where they have health centers, where you have organic farms, and you're all there and you're all computation, all trading tokens with your community currency, like that Bernard Leotier and Catherine Austin Fitz and Charles Eisenstein want you to play the tokens, that is a computational model. And you can see that the churches ultimately will be part of this public-private partnership. And they've got it played both ends. If they want the government out of your business, sure, Silicon Valley is going to invest in your church community. And so you can do, maybe you start out with tiny houses for refugees and the homeless or people in addiction because they're really great to access the field. People maybe with some mental stuff going on because they're really good at getting in the field and maybe these charter schools because those kids are really good at getting in the field, right? And then you move on to intentional communities and you have like your own stack and pack and dense community stuff for your parishioners. And then you start moving it all together. And then you've got the public private wedded to faith-based. Faith-based is not outside the public private partnership. It's actually, I think a pillar of it because the faith spirituality connection is so important. And so how do we communicate this to the leaders in our faith communities and say, okay, I know this sounds good, but is there some, there's some potential downsides. Can we talk about this? Because that's what I think my response, our responsibilities are. And I'm sorry, I can't make it super simple and give you like a little tiny dribbly drop that you can just hand out. But like, I need interpreters. I'm doing the really big picture. And then I need people to sort of distill that from their place on the game board and then figure out ways to talk to it. It is a process. And, you know, I think people keep saying like, I'm a certain way or I'm, no, I'm just doing it. I didn't think I was going to have to do this. I never thought this would be the thing I would be doing. But and you don't start off doing it great. You you it's like a sport. It's like knitting. You it's muscle memory. You've got to do it and then you do it again and then you do it again and then it becomes more natural and then you can figure it out. And sometimes we do it wrong or we don't say it perfectly and then we refine it. Sometimes I say things really long so I can try to eventually get it shorter. But we all have to start. And we all have to believe that we can do it. Because I believe in you. Like I was being a hard ass yesterday because I actually believe that people can do better than they're doing. I think these these frequency systems are dragging people down. And that that under, if we understood the game better, we could neutralize a lot more of this frequency and we could find a lot more authentic togetherness across difference than we are doing. And I'm trying to figure out how do we do that? But I can't do it by myself. And it's not... And I don't like influencer culture. I don't want to do it by myself. I want to do it with other people. So I think like that's why I keep showing up. So in the utopian community, um, you know, there's the kibbutz model. In the past, there have been other ones. There, you know, there were hippie communes, right? There have been these other models. But before the hippie communes, there were things like one of the site visits I did last year was the Octavia Hill Association. And the Octavia Hill Association was formed by 18th or 19th century, like urban planning movements in Great Britain. And they in turn were informed by utopian socialist communities. There's one you should look it up called New Lanark. And I can put the link to the, my map in here. But New Lanark was a Scottish textile community. Now, it was a mill town. It wasn't um, a spiritual community, but it was the first was the origins, I think it's early 19th century, maybe, of, uh, it was backed by the Quakers. They were the investors. And again, think children of light and Quakers, like physical connection to, you know, shaking with the divine and your biology. Um, these Quaker investors were investing in this Scottish mill town, and it was the first cooperative. And they did moral education, uh, and, and they had their own local currency, now, it wasn't all great because like you just had to do everything that was in the mill town. You didn't really have choices. The town was the game board. And then those Quakers, they expanded. And then I'm trying to remember the guy. I think it's Owens was his name, Robert Owens. And he came to Indiana and he bought a utopian community that relocated the, the raps. I think New Harmony. I think it was maybe in Indiana, New Harmony. So there was another. And again, Harmony is frequency, right? And so they... So there are these connections between 
Like one of the children was a geologist. One of them was attached to the Smithsonian, I think cultural artifacts. And a lot of the, the great awakening in upstate New York, like with the spiritualism was with the Fox sisters and they were connected to the Quakers. And so there is this interdimensionality that I think is happening that is kind of tied to intentional community. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm setting aside the judgment part just to see it for what it is, that the architecture of our social systems is part of a frequency-based access to the divine. And that at some point at a global scale, I think that there is a goal of monitoring it all in spatial computing, ultimately in ways that are invisible and are tied into self-assembling nanophotonic stuff <laughs> and rhodopsin and these engineer proteins and then coordinating it to some purpose and then what is that what i don't know what that is and and i don't know all the things i only can see the view from where i can see it but i have a view for now in philadelphia and so this is a very highly charged energetic space with a lot of very profound stories about patriotism around the mythology of what we are as a country. A lot of that is also intertwined with conservative Christianity, with mega churches. And so if you're someone who's taking the Agenda 21 narrative into faith-based communities and you're not telling them this other stuff, I'm just wondering why not? Why would you not tell faith-based institutions the full story so they can figure out when the thing shows up on their doorstep, how to make a good decision. Or are we only working on the like, I'm going to meet you where you are. I'm going to kind of dumb it down for you. I don't think you can handle the whole thing. I don't think you're smart enough to handle the whole thing. I'm just going to tell you a little slice of the story. And then maybe 20 years down the road, we'll baby step you to the actual story. No, that's not what you get here. <laughs> here, you get the full thing as I understand it now which I have the right to change and adjust at will, which is why I keep laying it out because I, I, I know that I don't know all of the pieces and that each, each of us individually has different pieces to this. But I'm not going to hold back and dumb it down for you because I don't think you can handle it. I'm actually saying you can handle it. It's, but yeah, actually, it's going to take some work. And yeah, if you're busy and you've got a bunch of kids and you've got a very demanding job, okay, I'm not going to say you're a terrible person for not doing this. This work isn't for everybody, not, not because you're dumb, but because you just don't have the time commitment. But there is a time commitment involved if you actually want to get the game board. And that, that's not everybody. And if you're not doing it, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means it's very lonely being out here on the edge. Um, so, yeah, so that's um, <clears throat> faith-based computing part two. Um, I will just, uh, to loop back a couple last, uh, historical things, you know, one of the other Philadelphia pieces is, uh, uh, the Kelpius, uh, the Kelpius monks waiting for the end of the world in the Wissican cave and Jakob Zimmerman and the pietist sects. And, you know, somebody else yesterday got all upset about my Swedenborg stuff. I don't think bad about Swedenborg. I think he's pretty interesting, right? I actually all have a whole map about Swedenborg and the Moravians. And I brought up the stuff about the Moravians and their Kundalini kind of goings on because it, I find it interesting. I find it helpful to understand the thing. Now, if you're team Swedenborg, you're going to imagine anything I say as if, if it's not glowing of Swedenborg is a negative thing. And that's because you're on a team, right? And you've joined the team. And so your team positions you in antithetical to the other team. I'm not on any of the teams. So I can see the slices of all the things and how they go together. And that's why that's the mind that I have. So I'm looking at the Moravians because part of my history is linked to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I had a certain view of the Moravians. And I didn't, again, I only had a limited view. I didn't have this bigger view. But the pietist religions, the early Protestant religions, the Jan Husses, right, that ripples forward in, again into a personal um, relationship with God. And just like the Kelpius, there were all these, like when, when, when the Protestant stuff came online, there were a lot of people who were like, I just want to do my own thing. And so um, Zinzendorf, he had a space in, Ch in Czech, what's now Czech Republic that was open to a lot of this. Uh, Kelpius, in the Kelpius monks, they had the first hymnal in North America. So that's important because it's frequency. And they, they did alchemy of the soul. 
All right. Yeah. Burma, Burma, all, all of that stuff. It's super important. Burma and the effort of cloister and Kelpius and Beisel. Now I'm not saying they're bad, but what I'm saying is if what we're talking about, they imagine they were doing alchemy of the soul through song and, <coughs> and prayer, right. And education. That's how they understood it. And I think that, I think that that's the thing because this alchemy is where Jung is at in the archetypal field. Now he's looking East. And so I've concentrated more on the Christian megachurches, but it's not just that because you think China's not in this game. You think the Indian subcontinent is not in this game. No, it is all. They're getting their own story that's relevant to their own history and cultural trajectory. And I, the, the no sphere is global project. So we have to understand all of that, but I can only speak to it from my position. But Jung is looking at chi, at prana, at the energy systems, at the fields, as archetypes and the soul. And again, that's where we've got Hillman and his take on Jungian analytics and the soul of the city. You could see how these smart cities would be remade as soul therapeutics with face-based communities, right? And energetic fields and community spiritual token currencies and how, goodness, how is that going to work with the Protestant work ethic, right? So you shall be done by your works. And then you do good works and you get more tokens against total behaviorism. But you can see how it's going to intersect if we don't talk about it first. So, um, so yeah, so the pietists and then within that, the Bertelsmann publishing, I would say people should talk about Bertelsmann because they were among the first publishers of the hymnals of these pietist hymnals. Again, frequency. And then where are they now? Well, they're in digital publishing, right? Frequency again. And the Bertelsmann in Germany, they were connected to very draconian welfare laws that were going to be tied into blockchain digital identity, right? So it matters that Bertelsmann publishing music, that it all goes back all the way to these pietist hymnals. I'm not saying the pietists were bad. I'm just saying, look at the trajectory. Look at the cycles. I think this isn't an ascension thing that there's a one direction. These are ideas that that pop up and go away. There's a it's a wave, right? We're in a wave form, and we need to understand the waves because there aren't really a lot of new ideas out there. There's just a lot of repackaging of old ideas that are already there. So um, anyway, so I'm looking over my notes. I think I've come to the end of most of what I wanted to say, but you know. The John Templeton Foundation doesn't team up with the Fesser Institute to look into spiritual capital lately. <laughs> That's happening for a reason. And so once you know that, and if you are a person of faith, how, however you practice your faith, and hopefully you practice it in a way that is authentic um, and that isn't hurting other people, think about it. Because it's coming. Just like I said to the health freedom people, the alt health community, what's coming? The marathon is managed wellness. Is managed wellness and prevention, right? There's a shock doctrine and there will be shake the can with various shocking things that happen. But the lockdowns isn't the whole game. It's just the beginning. The long term is, is managed wellness. And just think about like how that fits into all your favorite health, alt health influencers. How are they, how is the alt health business model any really that different from the big pharma business model? It's a business model, right? Like if, if, if you are about like totally healing everybody, you wouldn't have everybody on like ongoing supplements all the time. Like it's a business people, like let's wake up. So just as I said that about the alt health stuff, think about this in terms of the spirituality. So I'm just laying it out. And again, I'm willing to be wrong, <laughs> but Faith-based communities are central to the public-private partnership. It's not all about the government. It's about agent-based simulation modeling. And they're going to use faith communities to create their faith-based ant computers. And then we just actually have to understand if we're playing that game. So um, anyway, I uh, I hope maybe you got something out of this. I'm sorry I had to break it short earlier. Uh, but anyway, we're imperfect beings. So uh, be well, everybody. And uh Take care. All right. Bye-bye.